There's a few big news in the world of AI today, and the first one is this. ESM3, simulating 500 million years of evolution with a language model. We'll also talk about a company called Etched, and it's releasing what they're claiming to be the fastest AI chip of all time. Over half a million tokens per second, much faster than anything by NVIDIA or anything else. If I'm doing my math right, that would be the equivalent to writing all of the Harry Potter books, like all of them, in under three seconds. Tons of big names that are backers and supporters of this. Peter Thiel, Balaji, Stanley Druckenmiller, Brian Johnson's on there, the don't die guy, this guy, the uh, crazy guy that's trying not to die. But we'll come back to that in a second. But this is getting very interesting. So we've heard about AlphaFold out of Google DeepMind and its ability to predict these very complex 3D shapes of proteins. Proteins are the building blocks of life. They're the little factories that make life possible. As this post puts it, proteins are wondrous dynamic molecules with incredible functions from molecular engines that power motion to photosynthesis synthesis to skeletons to sensors like our eyes and ears and the information processing systems aka our brains they're the programs that are operating the system of life and these things are programmable the ribosome takes codes of protein in the form of rna and builds them up from scratch fabrication at the atomic scale these are little factories that are programmed to do certain specific things that make everything in life possible every cell in Every organism on Earth has thousands to millions of these molecular factories. By contrast, the machines, the tools, the factories we build barely scratch the surface. We are nowhere near the level of complexity of these things. And here's a sentence that I think kind of summarizes the point of this whole thing. If we could learn to read and write in the code of life, it would make biology programmable. We would be able to program life itself. Our trial and error approaches would be replaced by logic and the painstaking experiments by simulation. So right now, for example, how we create certain drugs is, I don't want to say we throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks, but that's not completely inaccurate. We're trialing a lot of different things. There's painstaking experiments. There's unforeseen side effects. The process works, but there's a lot of ways in which it could be improved. Being able to write this code, to custom create proteins, to understand how they work, would be a game changer. And so they're introducing themselves and their ESM3. It's a frontier language model. So similar to ChatGPT, Gemini, etc. It's a language model, except this one is created to program and create with the code of life. The point of it is to engineer biology from the first principles in the same way that we would engineer structures, machines, microchips, and software. And here they talk about an example of what this thing can do. So this is just an illustration, but as you can imagine, pretty much anything that life does or things that it doesn't even do yet may be possible if we crack this code. So here they're talking about the GFP. Remember that acronym? It's a green fluorescent protein. You often see these fluorescent things pop up in various research into DNA and editing DNA and stuff like that, simply because it's pretty easy to see if it works or not right? You look at it, does it glow? If yes, then you've succeeded. I'm saying that fluorescent proteins are responsible for the glowing colors of jellyfish and they're important tools in modern biotechnology. So here they've created the ESM GFP. Again, GFP is the glowing protein, right? And so their ESM GFP, their new protein has a sequence that's only 58% similar to the closest known fluorescent protein. So this new glowing protein that they found, this ESM GFP, how long would something like this take to evolve in the wild? If you just let nature and evolution take its course well, they're estimating that the generation of this new fluorescent protein is equivalent to simulating over 500 million years of evolution. Now, how were they able to create something like this? Well, with most AI models that we see today, we basically tokenize these things. Large language models take text, turn it into tokens. Sora, OpenAI's text-to-video model talked about tokenizing various aspects of video production. And here they've tokenized the biological properties of proteins. So basically they've broken them down into chunks that is easily read and understood by these AI neural nets. And they've created one that can reason over the three of the fundamental biological properties of proteins, sequence, structure, and function. Now, sequence is kind of the quote-unquote easy part. It's the sequence of amino acids that 
spell the protein. So kind of like letters in a word or words in, in a sentence, those spell out how the protein looks. Then we have the structure, the 3D structure. This is where AlphaFold from Google DeepMind made a big breakthrough. They were able to predict the 3D structure of proteins based on, on the sequence, something that would be impossible to do with a kind of a brute force approach. The number of possible variations of these structures is massive, something like, I think it's more than the amount of atoms in the universe or some insane number like that. And the third thing was function. So what are these sequences and structures? What do they do? ESM3's vocabulary bridges sequence, structure, and function all within the same language model. When this process is scaled across billions of proteins and billions of parameters, ESM3 learns to simulate evolution. And what this means is that this model can follow prompts to generate new proteins. And this AI model can generate in all three modalities. So here, if they're talking about sequence, structure, and function, it's not that, for example, it can just output the structure and, and the sequence if you're trying to find a certain function. So if you say, we want this glowing protein, yes, it can do that, but it also can generate in all three modalities. Why is this important? Well, it gives scientists the ability to generate new proteins with an unprecedented degree of control. For example, the model can be prompted to combine a structure, sequence, and function to propose a potential scaffold for an active site of, I'm guessing this is petase, an enzyme that the grades polyethanol terephthalate. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. Basically, this has been kind of a long search for sort of ability to create certain life forms that are able to break down plastic waste. So here's kind of an example of it generating the scaffold for the pet A's active site through multimodal prompting. And they're talking about emergence of capabilities with scale. ESM3's ability to solve challenging protein design tasks emerges with scale. For example, one such task, atomic coordination, tries to design a protein where the atomic positions of amino acids are distant in the sequence but close in the structure. So if you had like a string where A is here and then X is here, and there's a bunch of letters between, but these two are close. Well, I mean, that structure might look like something like this, where you have A and X close and there's some sort of a curve here. So they're close together in space, but divided by a long length of sequence. So the model is able to achieve atomic level accuracy in structure generation. And we see this with models, and this is, isn't fully understood. There's some debate about this, but it seems like at scale, certain new abilities emerge, or at least it seems like they emerge rapidly. Maybe there's, maybe there's some more gradual process, but as models get bigger, they develop new skills that are not at all seen in the smaller models. This model can also provide feedback to itself to improve the quality of its own generations. And so they're coming back to the protein that they found, they're calling this simulating the 500 million years of evolution, and back to our green fluorescent protein, discovery of which led to the award of the Nobel Prize and has become one of the most widely used tools in technology because it allows scientists to see proteins within cells, right? So because it's glowing, it's easily able to be seen. We're not going to dive too deep into the kind of scientific explanation because that might not be interesting or appropriate for some people, but I will leave this link and I suggest to the people that are interested that you read this because specifically what they're talking about is the fact that, you know, producing these fluorescent proteins is hard even for nature. So if you think about 500 million years of evolution is how long it would take to create something like that. It, it's not easy, right? This mechanism is unique. There are no other ones like it. And scientists have discovered many variants of this protein in nature and created variants of those natural proteins in the lab. So we've done that before. We find a way that nature did it, and then we create kind of our own copy of it, something similar to it. We were able to make them even more different from nature with certain mutations that increase the brightness or change the color. And more recently, with machine learning techniques, it's possible to extend the search to find more distant variants from what nature came up to, right, that differ from nature to even 20% of the sequence, right? So they're 20% different. That's as far as we were able to get to before this. Something that's 80% similar to how nature, how evolution developed it. But when we give our model the ASM3, we give it the structure of few residues in the core of natural GFP. So we showed how nature did it, right? How it sort of evolved these glowing proteins. And then the AI model is asked to reason in a chain of thought to generate candidates of this of, of new glowing proteins. 
this kind of jumped out at me, the fact that it's using chain of thought. It's the same kind of approach that we would use for ChatGPT or the other models that has been shown to improve its reasoning ability. Basically, it's asking to think through something step by step. So instead of jumping to a conclusion, we break down what we have into steps. In the math class, this would be called showing your work, right? You can a step by step show your work type of thing. Next, they're mentioning that generating one by pure chance is astronomically unlikely. There are more possibilities than the number of atoms in the visible universe. So the AI model comes up with some ideas, right? The test 96 generations that it came up with and they found a number of proteins that fluoresce, including one that was far from any protein in nature. Now, this one was 50x less bright than natural proteins of that sort. They continue that chain of thought, starting from that sequence of the protein B8. It's sort of that set of experimental proteins from the B8. And then they generate another 96 proteins, right? So it sounds like the AI gave them, let's say 96 generations. They found one that was very promising. So they said, give me 96 more like it. From that batch, they found that there were several proteins that have similar brightness to natural glowing proteins, including the brightest one in well C10. C10, I think this is just how they're kind of annotating their internal batches of generations. And this is the one that they found. And this is the one that's kind of the big deal. They're calling it the ESM. ESM is their model, evolutionary scale model. And GFP is that green fluorescent protein, the glowing protein. And this is where it gets even more interesting. This will be an open model. Since inception, this project has committed to open science with code and model releases. So basically whatever they're doing, both the model weights, so sort of the neural nets, the, the brain that they've trained, and the code that, that helps that model run, all the scaffolding and architecture around it, it's all open source. They believe that sharing research and code accelerates progress and contributes to understanding and reducing risk, ultimately maximizing positive impact for the world. They're releasing the weights and code for the ESM3 1.4 billion open model. And they're excited to see what you create. Now, I know some of you are probably filled with dread at that statement. Yeah, let's see what you can create with this godlike ability to modify life. I know some of us are very excited. Certainly a lot of pain and suffering and ill health can be reduced and prevented with something like this, potentially even one day, maybe unlocking, maybe if not immortality, then at least some sort of a way to slow down aging to where it's not even perceptible, right? This idea of negligible senescence has been thrown around or, you know, aging so slowly that you don't even notice. You basically stay at your current biological age forever. Can you guess where this link takes us if we click on it? It goes to GitHub. That's right. You can download and run this thing on your local computer. It's written in Python. It looks like you have to accept the non-commercial license. So this is for research and non-profit use only. And of course, this is the smallest and fastest model in that family. So they're releasing the 1.4 billion parameter models. And it looks like the largest model they have is 98 billion parameters. Mr. Jan LeCun himself gives kudos to the team behind evolutionary scale AI. So he's saying an AI for proteomics. So proteomics is kind of like genomics, but for proteins, so the ability to understand the makeup and how to program proteins. So AI for proteomics, a startup that just came out of stealth. They're introducing their ESM3, the 98 billion parameter generative LLM for programming biology. And the company was formed by former members of the Meta Fair Protein Group. So it looks like they have some ties to Facebook slash Meta. And, and they couldn't help but laugh at this. As you know, of course, Yan Kuhn really doesn't like LLMs and he thinks LLMs are kind of silly and foolish and stupid and they will not lead to AI or AGI or any sort of understanding of the world. He even went as far to say that all new sort of people, all the new students and kids going into college to learn about AI, the best advice he could give them, he said, don't work on LLMs. So there's a number of people here kind of jumping in. It's like, okay, so apparently this doesn't apply to this kind of research since this model is indeed an LLM. This is their website, evolutionaryscale.ai. Some of the use cases that they're kind of thinking about is, for example, creating proteins or imagining how to create proteins to capture carbon. Enzymes that break down plastic. Imagine various new medicines. And if you're interested, they have their paper that you can get as a PDF. And it's massive. It has tons of stuff in it, including a massive appendix with just a gold mine of stuff for people to dig into. But I am incredibly excited to see where people take this. In other news, this company claims to 
to have developed the fastest AI chip of all time. The company's etched and it's coming out of stealth mode. And it's claiming to be able to run, for example, in this case, Llama 70 billion parameter at over 500,000 tokens per second. So that's like the entire Harry Potter collection in under three seconds, which would let you build products that are impossible on, on GPUs, for example, NVIDIA's GPUs. They're saying one 8x Sohu server, so basically Sohu is this new chip that they're introducing, replaces 160 H100s from NVIDIA. How? Well, remember ASICs for Bitcoin mining, for example, you might remember seeing images of these uh, Bitcoin mining farms with these little rectangular things with fans attached. Basically, it's a processor that specialized in doing just one thing and nothing else, whereas something like NVIDIA can do a lot of different things. It can be used as a graphic accelerator for computers. It can be used for mining Bitcoin. It can be used for training neural nets, running inference on neural nets. Like it's very versatile. ASICs are basically specialized. In this case, for running inference on these transformer models. So all the Chad GPTs, the Gemini's, everything like that runs with the transformer architecture. By specializing, they get way more performance. These chips can't run any other types of neural nets. They can't run the convolutional neural nets or, or anything else, any other AI models. But the things that are very popular today, so the Chad GPT, Claude, Gemini, Sora, all that is powered by transformers. They're saying that chips are faster and cheaper than even NVIDIA's next generation Blackwell, which was recently announced. So apparently their chips are more than 10 times faster than the Blackwell. So these chips aren't out yet, so we're not able to get our hands on them. It's interesting because this is yet another competitor for NVIDIA potentially, along with Grok. And now this uh, brand new ASIC for the Transformer models. It'll be interesting to see how successful they are, but certainly it'll be interesting to see how this whole space develops. With that said, my name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.